Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and I must also say maybe good morning to those of us who are joining outside of Singapore, from Europe, and from other parts of the world. Thank you for joining us today at the Dense and Green Cities, Architecture as Urban Ecosystems online presentation and panel discussion. My name is Geraldine, and I will lead you through the program this evening, or today. Today, together with a distinguished panel, we will jointly explore the interaction between buildings and the city as ecological system. How do we integrate greenery into a densely built environment? What benefits does it bring to the city's inhabitants? How can we make a dense city more sustainable, livable, and resilient? These are some topics that we will explore today. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Design Singapore Council for supporting this event and making it possible. With this, it is apt to start off this evening with an opening address by Mr. Mark V, Executive Director of Design Singapore Council. Mr. Mark Wee is a design thinking pioneer in Singapore, having designed award-winning innovative experiences for both the public and private sector. As a design veteran with wide industry connections, Mark has brought the work of the council to the attention of global design leaders. He is an architect by training, an award-winning one, who was recognized by the Urban Redevelopment Authority in 2017 as the top 20 under 45 architects in Singapore that would define the next generation. Please welcome Mr. Mark Wee. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, warm welcome to the Dense uh, Green Cities webinar, uh, which we at the Design Singapore Council are proud to co-host with the Singapore ETH uh, Future Cities Lab Laboratory and the Singapore University of Technology and Design. I'm Mark, um, the Executive Director of the Design Singapore Council. I'm also very happy to welcome such a wonderful and diverse audience from Singapore and also beyond our shores. I understand that today actually we have guests from Europe, the US, and other Asian countries as well. I saw a shout out from Philippines earlier. Uh, so just thank you for joining all of us this evening, or at least this evening for us. A number of our guests may be joining in for the first time, so I'd like to take a few moments to actually just introduce the Design Singapore Council and actually what we do. Uh, as the National Agency for Design, our vision is actually for Singapore to be an innovation-driven economy and a lovable city through design. Uh, our work focuses actually on three areas. First, we help organizations and enterprises actually use design as a strategy to grow business and deliver people-centered public services. The second, actually, we play a large role in nurturing industry-ready talents and enabling a design-minded uh, workforce for our future economy. And the third, uh, we really want to advance the Singapore brand through um, raising design appreciation on home ground and also emotional connections with people across the world through the seminar like the seminar right now. So today's topic on the future of urban design and architecture is actually something that's very close to our hearts, especially mine being an architect. Our dense green cities collaboration started with the Future Cities Lab and SUTD, um, the Uni Singapore University of Technology and Design, a few months ago through the joint organization of an exhibition hosted at our own National Design Center. The center is currently shut due to COVID measures, but I'd love to show you some photos of the setup anyway. So my favorite part of the exhibition actually is this central installation of an organic structure interwoven with lush ferns. Um, my colleague reminded me, he said that these ferns might well be dead when we get back in. I hope not, but this is, at least we captured this beautiful photo to show what you could have enjoyed if you were um, able to come to our center. Uh, this also reminds me of one of Singapore's most stunning buildings, the Oasia Hotel downtown, which is also featured in the exhibition later, and which we awarded the President's Design Award in 2018. It's actually one of the projects showcased in the exhibition and will be covered in the main presentation uh, later this evening. Such architectural innovation can actually be contextualized in Singapore's wider national ambition to be a city in the garden. With an area of around 720 square kilometers and a population of about 5.6 million people, Singapore actually has one of the highest population densities in the world. So while it may seem like a luxury to set aside land for parks instead of residential, commercial, or industrial use, our urban planners actually have recognized early on that well-designed natural nature spaces are essential in a livable and lovable city. Now, especially as the country undergoes circuit breaker measures that require more, almost everyone to work and study from home, me included. 
So the such quick access to green spaces for a short stroll or jog in the neighborhoods has actually been a huge relief to many. And hence we did a poll earlier trying to understand who was using the nearest parks and the nearest green spaces. Uh, being in a small city state with a highly uh, modernized and urbanized population, going in this direction is essential for residents to thrive and for the country to flourish. So the future of architecture and planning in Singapore must actually continue, we feel, to explore how greenery and density can be integrated to ensure that we live, work, and play in healthy and optimal environments. And this is why we're actually proud to support projects like the Dense Green Cities project as part of our own larger Design Future series, which actually furthers a global conversation about how design can respond to challenges and ch and changes like rapid urbanization, climate change, technology disruption, and other issues shaping society and increasingly know. So um, going forward. As designers are always reimagining the future, that's what we do best. We believe that introducing their work to the public will help add to the current discourse of our future. By providing a platform for our design, such design futures content, we hope to inspire the public to come together, start conversations, and co-create solutions to complex challenges. And of course, today, the greatest challenge that we all face is undoubtedly this COVID-19 pandemic which is one reason why we're all actually viewing this from home. I'm viewing this from my bedroom. And the pandemic has certainly brought about devastation, but has also created opportunity. An opportunity for us to reflect, regroup, and maybe reimagine a new future for us all. So I very, look, very much look forward to the presentations and discussions of this evening. And this will undoubtedly uncover rich insights into this topic. Um, and beyond tonight, we hope you'll keep in touch with us to continue this exploration and conversation. So really, if you're here, do follow us on our social media through the links here and stay connected through our mailing list as we'll be working hard to bring you more such content on design futures in the coming months. So enjoy the evening. I think it's very heartening to know that the Design Singapore Council is not only trying to make Singapore more livable, but also more lovable. So this is a very interesting dimension. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yes. Um, yeah. And some of you would have seen the exhibition and would may know that the exhibition and the book Dance and Green Cities is based on a research project at the Future Cities Laboratory under the Singapore ETH Center. The Future Cities Laboratory, also known as FCL, is established by ETH Zurich and the National Research Foundation of Singapore in collaboration with partners, including the Singapore University of Technology and Design, or SUTD. The program seeks to shape future cities through its research based on science, by design and in place. In this context, the research on dense and green building typologies was started as one of the 12 projects under the program. We have the pleasure today of learning more about the FCL from Professor Stephen Kent, Program Director of the Future Cities Laboratory at the Singapore ETH Centre. Before his appointment as the Program Director of FCL, he was the Head of Department of for Architecture and Director of the Edinburgh School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture. He has published books including Drifting, Migrancy and Architecture, The Sage Handbook of Architectural Theory, Buildings Must Die, A Perverse View of Architecture. Please welcome Professor Stephen Kent. Hi, everybody. Um, very nice to um, join you, even if it's uh, remote. Um, this is a very interesting kind of new format I think that we're all getting used to. And there's some wonderful opportunities, um, particularly to be able to talk to you from in different parts of the world. Um, as Geraldine said, my name is Stephen Cairns. I'm the director of the Future Cities Laboratory. Um, our home university is uh, ETH Zurich, um, and we've been based in Singapore for some time now, and we collaborate with universities in Singapore and also um, in the region. Um, as Geraldine said, uh, our mission is to shape sustainable cities through science, by design, in place. Now we're often, uh, we, we're very interested in the tension between these three words, science, design, and place. Science, of course, aspires to universally applicable truths. Um, place, of course, is, is about the opposite. It's about identification of localities which are different, uh, be that through the way it engages with environment or history or culture. And we like to think about design as a kind of uh, practice and discipline that helps link science and place. 
Um, it's of course no accident that we are based here in Singapore uh, because Singapore has a very particular um, and exemplary role in developing a certain kind of technologically advanced city. And this has massive uh, interest worldwide and it is a direct example for the way in which cities all around us in Asia, in this most rapidly developing region of the world, um, Singapore in a way functions as one of the kind of prominent models for developing a city well, which is one of the reasons why uh, ETH is interested in being in Singapore. Um, if you're thinking about science design in place, of course, this is very complex, quite difficult to do. It's obviously interdisciplinary. Um, and the work that you'll hear this evening in, is from the Project Ensign Green. It's a great example of this kind of work. Uh, you'll see the work of architects, urban designers, ecologists, landscape architects, sociologists. I even think there are some economists involved. Now, all of these different disciplinary figures speak slightly different languages. They probably all speak English, but I mean by language, a specific kind of disciplinary language. So a certain approach, a certain way of doing research, a certain way of considering something to be data or not, a um, certain way of publishing and outputting that research. So in FCL, particularly with our uh, 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 institutional colleagues, we've developed uh, a certain way of thinking about complex questions uh, in inter interdisciplinary ways. And it's not easy to do, and we're very pleased that you get to see a great example um, of that this evening. Um, and then finally, uh, another thing that we do is that we are not solo operators here. We interact with local institutions, and of course, Singapore University of Technology and Design and Design Singapore are two of those. So I'm really excited about this evening's work. Um, I hope, uh, as, as Mark said, please, if we ever get to travel again, we hope that you come and visit us. If not, in the meantime, please look out for us on the normal social media um, uh, and website channels. Thanks again, and have a, great, uh, have a great session. I'll see you again soon later on. Thank you, Professor Stephen Kentz. As mentioned earlier, the webinar is organized in conjunction with an exhibition and also the launch of the book of the same name, Dense and Green Cities, Architecture as Urban Ecosystem. As the author of the book, Professor Thomas Schroepfer has the challenge of bringing the exhibition and book alive through this presentation this evening. He is the founding associate head of Pillar of Architecture and Sustainable Design at the Singapore University of Technology and Design, or SUTD, and principal investigator of the Dense and Green Building Typology Research Project at the Future Cities Laboratory. He has received prestigious awards and recognitions, including the Asia Education Leadership Award, President's Design Award, which is the Singapore's highest honour accorded to designers and designs across all disciplines. Please welcome Professor Thomas Schroepfer. Thank you, Geraldine. Uh, good evening from uh, Singapore and uh, thank you, Mark and Stephen, uh, for your introductions. Also, a big thank you from my side uh, to Design Singapore Council and the National Design Center. Uh, Singapore for supporting and hosting our exhibition and tonight's event. So for the next 45 minutes or so, I will try to provide you with an overview of our work on dense and green architecture and cities. And I'm gonna start sharing my screen now with you. So before I go into, into the actual presentation, uh, I wanna highlight that uh, to work on a project like this, of course, you can't do this by yourself. Uh, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about tonight is the result of hard work over the last uh, four and a half years. Uh, on a project called Dense and Green Building Typologies, which as uh, both Mark and Stephen mentioned, uh, as well as Geraldine, is part of the Future Cities Laboratory here uh, in Singapore. I'm the principal investigator of this project. My co-principal investigator is also joining us tonight, is Professor Sasha Menz from the ETH uh, Zurich. We had a wonderful research team as well uh, that you can see in the slide here. And we had many, many contributors, both from uh, government agencies as well as practice. So you see, it's quite a long and impressive list of uh, stakeholders that we were able to work with over the last four to five years. So my presentation tonight will uh, largely go along two major publications that came out of the Dense and Green research. One is a book that came out right at the beginning of uh, FCL2, uh, and it is titled um, 
dense and green, innovative building types for sustainable urban architecture. So in a way, it a little bit predates the work that we did uh, with the Future Cities Lab, but it just shows you this is a topic that uh, I have uh, worked on for quite some time. Uh, for a topic like this, I think it's important to not just try to cover this all by yourself. So just like I was supported by a research team, uh, for a book publication like this, it's good to bring in other experts. So you see the list here. It includes some quite illustrious names, including Kees Christian, Zeh Herbert Dreiseitel, Foster and Partners, uh, MVR, DV Atelier, Tenwoha, and so on. So what we try to do with this first book is to explore innovations in architectural typologies that originate from the integration of green components such as sky terraces, green facades and vertical parks in high density buildings. So we did this through a series of in-depth case studies but really very much the uh, focus of this first book was an architectural view. So we felt something is happening there's a very interesting uh, new paradigm uh, coming up in the discourse of architecture, landscape architecture and urbanism. And we felt it was the right time to explore this through a series of uh, case studies. The second book, which is actually the, the basis for uh, the exhibition at the National Design Center, uh, and very much the result of the work of the last four and a half years at the, the Future Cities Laboratory is Dense and Green Cities, Architecture as Urban Ecosystem, which of course is also the title of tonight's uh, presentation. Uh, again, there are contributors to the book, um, including Peter Rowe. Uh, there are some colleagues from ETH Zurich and of course my co-principal investigator, uh, Sasha Menz. So in this book, uh, we try to um, kind of, the, the research is really on the emergent understanding of the building and the city as uh, ecological systems. And uh, we were very interested in the question of the interaction of particularly large scale buildings with uh, the city. So the question here is, in which ways can buildings contribute to the ecology of their surroundings? How can urban districts with their green and blue networks link up with the elements and technologies of building design? So again, we, uh, we investigate all these questions through uh, a number of essays as well as benchmark uh, case studies. And as in the previous book, uh, we collaborated with a number of uh, renowned architects, urbanists, landscape designers, as well as uh, government agencies uh, in Singapore. So the structure of the book is what you see below. Uh, we start with what we refer to as dense and green agendas. Uh, that is followed by a second part of the book which talks about dense and green dimensions. That's really the kind of scientific backbone of, of the research that we did. Uh, followed by the case studies and uh, a kind of a speculation of where all of this is gonna lead us in the future. So I'll use the books, as I said, as a, as a kind of a, an image a backdrop for the argument I'm trying to make here. So we start with uh, the emerging dense and green paradigm. And uh, when you look back in history, of course, the idea of integrating landscape architecture and architecture is, is not really new and uh, this uh, image, this um, engraving from the 19th century uh, depicts uh, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world which are the hanging gardens of uh, Babylon and you see probably an architecture that at that time would go for a high density uh, building but you see even though this is just an imagination of what this building might have looked like you see a very close integration of uh, greenery and, uh, and architecture. So when we fast forward to modern times, this is uh, 1931, uh, the famous Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier. So with the modern movement, there are again these, these ideas that the building could somehow integrate or at least replace the the greenery that it uh, occupies with its footprint on the ground on the roof level. Uh, so this certainly was a, was a paradigm shifting uh, project in the, uh, in the history of uh, architecture. 
Again, we fast forward another 70 years to the year 2000 and the, the very important Expo 2000 that in that year took place in uh, Hanover in Germany. And a lot of the discourse of this event was uh, on sustainability, providing better models for uh, future cities and also architecture in uh, such future cities. And what you see here in the, in the images is what I think was a very important project in, in that respect. It is the Netherlands Pavilion by MBRDB, and you see uh, literally the architects stack uh, landscape and architecture in a building that is then topped by uh, energy production, in this case uh, windmills. So it's, I would say it's not so much a building, but more a statement about what future architecture and landscape architecture in a highly populated uh, place like the Netherlands could, uh, could look like. So here you see that building in uh, elevation. And this image is uh, not taken outside of the building. It is uh, somewhere in the middle um, where you see that the architects literally took nature as the structure for, uh, for the pavilion. Again, we jump forward uh, to the year 2008. Uh, so more recently, we see a lot of explorations of this uh, combination of landscape architecture and architecture. Uh, this is one example on the left is uh, Atelier Jean Nouvel's uh, 10,000 uh, Santa Monica Boulevard in uh, Los Angeles. This is not a built example but it shows you that the discourse certainly is, is very interested in, uh, in this combination. And this in a place, uh, California, uh, Los Angeles, that is not necessarily known for uh, sustainable architecture. On the right, you see a built example that we have also studied as part of our research. It is uh, Stefano Burri Architects uh, Bosco Verticale in Milan from the year 2015. And here you have a larger image of this project. So I think this one is a very interesting uh, example of a dense and green architecture in Europe. So a couple of things to highlight here. The building is certainly bigger, larger than its urban context. So there is an idea of densification. And uh, the ambition of the architects here was not just to provide a, a beautiful uh, small skyscraper, uh, with uh, luxurious uh, residences, but uh, also to do something for the immediate urban environment that it is part of. In this case, it is a very polluted, uh, air polluted part of uh, Milan and uh, the ambition of the architects here was through the use of plants, in this case, literally providing a vertical forest for the city of Milan to improve uh, the environmental quality of, uh, of the district. Here's a little bit closer up, uh, the same building. So you see uh, large cantilevering um, balconies uh, occupied with uh, quite uh, intense uh, greenery. All of this is uh, done in collaboration with uh, botanists. So this is uh, very much maintained. It changes color over the course of the year. So in addition to uh, offering environmental services, certainly there's, a, there's a quite an interesting aesthetic that emerges from uh, projects like this. Closer to home here in Singapore, this is the project that uh, Mark mentioned in his introduction. This is Woha's uh, Oasia Hotel downtown, seen from uh, street level, a very interesting building uh, here in the heart of the central business district of uh, Singapore. So you see what originally started as a screen facade uh, in red. You see this on the upper part of the building is slowly overgrown with uh, greenery from behind the facade. Uh, so ultimately this project will be uh, an entirely uh, green, green building in the heart of uh, Singapore. This is the same building seen from what I believe is level 26. So uh, we're looking down on one of the very, very large uh, sky gardens in that building. In fact, about uh, 
80% of this building are sky gardens. Only about 20% of the building is in closed volume. It is a mixed use uh, project. So it has a hotel, it has office buildings, it, uh, office components. It has uh, some residential components. So all of this is combined in a, in a high density, high livability uh, project par excellence. In our research over, over the last couple of years, we have looked at uh, many, many aspects of uh, such dense and green buildings, including, of course, the, the technologies that uh, go with this. So I will just give you an overview of the various dimensions that uh, we were interested in. So this, for example, is a contribution by Atelier 10, uh, Nari Pinyabatana, who uh, looked at uh, how buildings uh, with greenery perform better, particularly in the tropics, because in the tropics it's all about cooling buildings, and of course the greenery can, can help with exactly that. But we also looked at uh, the buildings, the dense and green buildings contribution to the urban context that is a, it is part of. So think about uh, urban heat islands, uh, and of course a building that uh, works with a lot of greenery can help uh, to um, mitigate uh, urban heat island effects uh, as well. We have looked at uh, aspects of blue-green infrastructures for buildings in livable cities. And for this, uh, we worked for some time with uh, Herbert Reiseitel, who you might know is a, is a very well-known uh, landscape architect, German landscape architect, who did some really pioneering work, uh, including the one that you see in this slide here on the right is uh, Potsdamer Platz in Berlin, the year 2000, where retention ponds were included uh, in the center of uh, what is now a very, very dense part of uh, the capital of uh, Germany. But it's not just the functionality of, of blue and green that Herbert Reiseitel was in here and discusses in his essay. It is also uh, the, the, the kind of new quality, you see the livability aspect uh, that comes to the foreground quite nicely. We have looked into biological functionalities of uh, green and uh, this dimension includes, um, for example, how greenery reduces soil erosion and regulates water flows in cities, how greenery can help improve water quality, how it improves air quality, as mentioned in the case of, uh, of Stefano Burry's uh, project in uh, Milan. We have looked at the very large scale as well. Here's a contribution uh, titled Green Urbanism, uh, Models of a Dense and Green Urban Context by Kees uh, Christiansen, who was uh, very much involved in uh, what's still the current phase of the Future Cities Laboratory. And uh, he's not, he was, he's retired now, but uh, he has also uh, uh, an important practice in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, KCAP, which of course uh, executed uh, projects like this all over the world. Uh, zooming in on the, on the architectural scale, um, there are very interesting implications of what we refer to the, as the dense and green paradigm for dense and green building typologies. Uh, for example, museums. And uh, the example that you see here on the right is Herzog de Meuron's uh, Miami uh, Art Museum from uh, 2013. And this is a great example, also in a tropical context, how uh, greenery is woven through uh, a series of boxes that uh, contain the actual museum content. So in a way, the, the result is uh, both landscape architecture and architecture. And it's not just aesthetically a very interesting effect, uh, again, because of the proximity to the water in this case, uh, and uh, the occasional flooding of the area that this uh, building is part of, it also has uh, it, it, has, it provides a, a very important ecological service to the city of uh, Miami. Uh, this is all to highlight that, of course, dense and green buildings are not something particular to uh, Singapore, but uh, I would say that uh, these uh, typologies have been experimented with all over the world. 
So on the right, you see uh, another example, a very famous example by now, which is James Corner Field Operations, Dillos Ophidio and Renko's uh, High Line in uh, New York uh, from the year 2008, here in a larger image. So it's a, it's a very interesting uh, idea to adapt, um, in this case, a, an old piece of infrastructure, an elevated uh, railway uh, that ran through a good part of uh, lower Manhattan all the way to Midtown, and to make this uh, a linear park. And this project, as I'm sure you know, uh, is not only famous, but has also been uh, inspiring many other projects uh, all over the world including uh, MV RGB's uh, Seolu uh, project in uh, Seoul in uh, Korea. Talking about the dense and green case studies that uh, we have looked at, um, I would like to start with uh, the Kutek Wat Hospital here in Singapore, which I think is, is a very interesting uh, institutional case. Uh, Kutek Wat Hospital was located uh, in a much bigger campus before it moved into its new uh, building that you see here on the on the photograph and as the the hospital had to move to its new location with a much smaller footprint um, the the management uh, of uh, Kutek Quat uh, asked the architects to uh, please um, help to maintain the quality of the old hospital with its lush setting and a lot of greenery around it and to bring this somehow in a high density project and of course the, the approach that the architects took because there is no no other option is to fold the greenery into the into the vertical dimension of uh, the project so what i'll show you here uh, the section of the building uh, i believe that you can see my mouse moving over the drawing uh, so you see how greenery is uh, included on multiple levels. There's a very large kind of atrium space and the building opens up to an adjacent uh, urban uh, park. So it makes direct uh, connection to this. It kind of pulls in the, the local ecosystem into the building and folds it up into the vertical dimension. What you see on the left are two shots of this project taken on the uh, different levels, um, none of them being the ground floor. Uh, so you see the greenery is, is uh, very prominent on, on all the levels. You see sky bridges, uh, planter boxes uh, used everywhere. And then on the lower image, you see a very interesting component, which is an, an urban farming component that uh, the architects decided to include. And that has been very successful in uh, growing uh, all sorts of things that are consumed uh, by the hospital itself, but it is also a way to bring in uh, the, the neighbors of the hospital. So it is uh, not just run by the hospital, but indeed it actually functions as a, as a social connector for uh, the whole urban context that this project is uh, part of which in a way is, is a good um, moment to introduce uh, also the social component that we're interested in, in these projects. So greenery can of course bring people together, be it in the form of uh, just a simple sky garden that is a common or public space in a project, but uh, certainly also with uh, urban farming that has uh, gained tremendous popularity in uh, Singapore over the last uh, couple of years. Another institutional building uh, I would like to mention here is School of the Arts, a project by uh, Boha. Uh, it predates uh, the OASIA Hotel uh, downtown by a couple of years. Uh, but you see uh, here in the view from the adjacent Dobigaud Green, which is uh, an urban park, you see the inclusion of greenery on the facade. And when we look in the upper right, we look at the building straight on from the adjacent uh, green public space. You see how the architects divide um, the, the massing into three blocks. And in a way, they pull the greenery through, this, uh, through these void spaces throughout the building. And you see in the section uh, how the footprint is replicated as a green space 
uh, on top with uh, trees and a running track that connects all these three uh, volumes on a higher level. So again, it's, it's the same idea that uh, the building section in a way becomes an extension of the adjacent uh, urban uh, green and blue space. Uh, we are going to another typology. Now we're looking at uh, an early example of a residential typology here in uh, Singapore. Uh, Newton Suites by the same architects, uh, Boha. And uh, to, to work on a residential project of this size, it is actually very important for the architects to break down the volume into uh, parts um, and include common spaces that bring people together. So this is an early example where you see the cantilevering uh, small green spaces every five levels that in a way introduce a kind of a mini neighborhood in an otherwise very or fairly large uh, residential uh, development. So this is then combined with uh, a green wall that runs uh, the entire uh, height of, of the building. So on the left, in the, the, the aerial view, you see this, uh, these, these um, common spaces for, uh, for the residents of uh, Newton Suites, as well as in the section. You also see that uh, otherwise very utilitarian structures like uh, the parking garage are used for, again, a common space where there's a blue space, there's a, there's a, a pool, uh, there's a lot of greenery included and you see that again the greenery is pulled up from the ground level all the way to the very top uh, of the building. So this is a, a private residential development, but uh, these strategies have uh, since then also been employed in uh, a number of uh, housing, public housing projects or uh, housing development or, uh, projects in the context of Singapore. Here you see a bit closer up uh, a typical unit and uh, I want to highlight here again the section. So as you live in one of these units, you have a, a visual connection to a tree, a green space right in front of your unit. Another great example in, uh, in our opinion is uh, the, the interlace by uh, OMA and Bureau Ole Sharon, RSP architects were the local architects for this one. This one is a very interesting uh, project because it also offers a completely different take on uh, the typology, the type of a residential development. So it is not the typical podium tower typology that you see in many, many of the, the developments here in Singapore. But in a way, it rethinks this and breaks down a, a very large volume in a series of blocks that you see here in plan uh, that then uh, enclose a smaller uh, common courtyard spaces and of course they also introduce um, these uh, sky gardens and roof gardens that part of them are common so they're open to all the residents of the interlace part of them some of them are uh, part of the the units that are adjacent to them but you see here in the in the aerial shot here I give you the, the bigger uh, aerial uh, photograph. So you see there's a very interesting, again, combination of landscape architecture on multiple levels uh, in the project, um, as well as a, a kind of a, an opening up of what would otherwise be uh, a very large, bulky volume. And I'm going to use this project also to highlight that often uh, architects of such uh, developments they try quite consciously to connect to larger urban blue and green systems. In this case, you see here in the background, uh, Southern Ridges, Singapore Southern Ridges, which is a, a green corridor that runs uh, east-west in, in the southern part of uh, the island. And the architects try to, to pull this into, into uh, the massing of the project. And there are very interesting effects in terms of biodiversity as well as rainwater retention and release and uh, serving some of these bigger urban uh, blue and green networks with a project like, like this. Just to give you an idea of the, the scale of a project like uh, the interlace. So the interlace has uh, just over a thousand units. 
So that means is about three and a half thousand, four thousand people that uh, live in a development like this. So it's it's quite a massive scale, and I would say it justifies to look at buildings like this as as almost kind of small uh, small city districts. Uh, we have covered residential uh, developments. We have looked at uh, institutional buildings. Uh, so now we have a quick look at some. Uh, infrastructure examples. Uh, some of you who are here from Singapore or from the region, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Singapore's airport, Changi, and uh, its Terminal 3, I think, is a, is a prime example for exactly that kind of thinking in an infrastructure project. So in Terminal 3, uh, the architects decided to include uh, greenery on a fairly impressive scale on the interior of the building. And you see here, all of this is topped uh, with uh, quite an interesting roof that allows for daylight to filter and in a way provide optimum uh, daylight conditions for the plants underneath. Uh, this roof was designed by the, the American firm uh, SOM. So here you see uh, the result. Um, uh, again, greenery uh, greets you as you as you move through this building uh, everywhere. And uh, the, the most recent development in in, Sha in Changi is, uh, of course, the the jewel, which I would say uh, pushes this this whole idea of the integration of greenery in an infrastructure uh, project to the extreme. So we're looking here at a rendering, but now, of course, the project is completed of. Uh, the, the so-called Jewel, a project by uh, Safdi Architects. And uh, what I want to highlight here is the section of this building. So it is a commercial project, yet uh, the client and the architects decided to have a very large kind of um, botanical garden on, on the interior and make this uh, the heart of uh, the whole of uh, Shangi Airport. And I would say that that actually says a lot about uh, how Singapore uh, thinks about the integration of greenery. Uh, again, uh, let me stress here that this is uh, not a public project. This is a commercial project, of course. And uh, still the clients believe that uh, including such an attraction uh, on the interior of this building would uh, allow itself uh, to be marketed in the, in the kind of most optimum uh, way. So this is, by the way, this is not a rendering. This is the, the actual uh, jewel as it is today. Uh, the examples I just shared with you were uh, mainly Singaporean examples. Uh, I just want to include here one uh, that we also looked at uh, over the last uh, four and a half years, which is One Central Park, another project by Atelier Jean Nouvel in, uh, in Sydney, in Australia, fairly recent project as well. And uh, I chose to include this in today's presentation because it shows some interesting aspects in a different uh, climate. Uh, in this case, the building shows, uh, the building section here shows a very large um, mirror that uh, helps to redirect uh, sunlight into the depth of uh, this atrium space here. Uh, that extends uh, below ground level, and in a way, the help of uh, with the help of technology, a dense and green building is is possible uh, in a in a climate that otherwise would would probably be more uh, problematic in terms of uh, achieving the necessary uh, daylight that you need for the plants to grow. So I think this. Uh, is an interesting example as well. Again, is it, it is a high density project, a mixed use project. So it is in a way uh, a, a small vertical uh, city. Here on the upper right, you see uh, again the, the technology part, the heliostat or the mirror that uh, helps to redirect the uh, light and allow plants to grow on, the, on all levels uh, of, of the building. By the way, the, the greenery is uh, designed by Patrick Blanc, uh, quite a well-known uh, botanist from uh, France, who has worked with uh, Herzog de Moron and many other uh, important current practices on uh, a number of projects all over the world. 
In our research, uh, we very much like to bring in the knowledge of the practitioners that have explored such buildings over, over many years. And uh, I think it's, it's fair to say that Foster and Partners is certainly one of the, the pioneers of including green spaces in high density uh, buildings. So they provided us with uh, their knowledge on, in this case, environmental performance optimization on the urban and the building scale. Uh, projects that, uh, seminal projects that they uh, authored, of course, include the Commerzbank building in Frankfurt. Unfortunately, I have no slide of this here, but it is uh, a high-rise building in, in Germany that includes green spaces on uh, multiple levels. So I think that was one of the early ones in Europe. Uh, another one includes the, the Gherkin in uh, London or projects uh, such as the one that you see uh, here on the, on the right, which is called the Great Glass House. And uh, you will obviously see the resemblance of uh, projects that, that predate um, the jewel by 18, yeah, about 18 years uh, with what is currently going on in a place like uh, Singapore. We have worked uh, quite closely also with MBRDV, uh, a well-known Dutch uh, practice. Uh, I shared with you earlier in the presentation their important uh, Netherlands pavilion from the year 2000. So this is certainly another example of a practice that has engaged with the inclusion of green spaces in many, many of uh, their projects over the years. Uh, the project that you see here is Maki Next, is a project that has not been executed yet from the year 2012, a rendering uh, for uh, a shopping mall in the heart of uh, Barcelona in Spain, where the, the volume of the building is uh, pushed into the ground. And uh, it gives then the architects the opportunity to have a continuous uh, green space, public park on the on the rooftop, which they felt was, was important for this uh, very dense part of the city of uh, Barcelona. Uh, these are other examples, um, including the one on the right, uh, a project called Peruri 88 in Jakarta uh, from the year 2012, a massive mixed use building uh, that includes greenery, landscape space, common and public spaces on, on many, many levels. Uh, this project is uh, currently on hold, but nevertheless, I decided to include it in the presentation just to, in a way, illustrate uh, where the discourse stands. So if architects could, they would uh, probably uh, push um, building design in, in this direction. So we're back here with uh, BOHA, a practice that, of course, because of the, the physical proximity uh, we're in here with them in Singapore, have worked with on, on many, many of uh, their projects, meaning they have provided us with uh, uh, a lot of their insights for, for our research. So here again, you see on the right, uh, the School of the Arts in a, in a section. And what I referred to earlier, the extension of the green space, Dobi Gao Green, uh, public uh, green space in the heart of Singapore all the way through the building, all the way up uh, to this connected uh, roof with a running track for the students of this, this institution. I mentioned earlier when I spoke about uh, the Newton Suites, uh, the private residential development that uh, since that project, um, Boha has also been able to uh, bring these ideas, these design strategies in some of the projects that they did for public housing, for the Housing Development Board here in Singapore. Here is an award-winning project on the left uh, titled um, Skyville at uh, Dawson, a massive development, uh, roughly the same scale like uh, the, the interlace that I shared with you earlier. So again, you see quite nicely in the building section the inclusion of uh, green common spaces for the residents, uh, a roof garden that tops all of this. And you see uh, here to the, to the left, uh, the use of uh, the parking structure as a, as a kind of a small neighborhood uh, park on an, on an elevated uh, level. Uh, 
We have also worked with uh, Ken Young, and you know, if I refer to some of the other practices of, as pioneers, I would say he is really the pioneer among the pioneers. Uh, he is uh, responsible for a number of projects uh, here in Singapore, including the, uh, the National uh, Library, and he is certainly one of the uh, the architects that for a long time have thought about uh, both on the building scale as well as on the urban scale about a meaningful uh, integration of uh, green and, uh, and architectural design. He has, in more recent years, he has uh, also participated in a number of uh, urban scale competitions. Here you see uh, his proposal for Hong Kong Kowloon Master Plan from the year 2009. Uh, because what we see in a lot of these uh, architects uh, thinking is, uh, of course, the realization that a uh, dense and green building makes most sense when it is connected to a larger uh, urban green and, uh, and blue system. So where does all of this uh, leave us and what is there to say about the dense and green future? So certainly some of the, the practices that we have uh, worked with over the years, they have, they have all developed their, their ideas and uh, at times visualize their, uh, these ideas for what a dense and green uh, urban future might uh, look like. So I give you here as a, as a big image, a rendering from uh, the year, I believe 2011 uh, by uh, Boha. So certainly this is a practice that has over the years um, gained a lot of experience with the uh, this, this building type, this dense and green building type. And here is a, a vision that they put forward in the context of a design studio that they ran here in Singapore at the National University of Singapore with uh, a number of students. So you see these ideas playing out on a really massive scale. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Singapore, Singapore is land sparse. In other words, uh, space is, is limited. So therefore, I think uh, Singapore for quite a number of years now has been on the forefront of experimenting with uh, building types that uh, do not sacrifice livability, ideas of uh, large public and, and common spaces, uh, but really to explore how those uh, amenities and services in the city can be can unfold on the, not just the ground level, but on multiple levels. So this is uh, a kind of a visionary example of this. It's called a permeable uh, lattice city. So you see here in the background, uh, you see a stadium, you see uh, parks, you see uh, productive landscapes, you see um, windmills. So it is really, uh, clearly the ambition to, to provide a vertical city, but uh, also a, a livable kind of a livable vertical sustainable environment. I already mentioned that uh, Singapore uh, in many respects is, is on the forefront of uh, the exploration of uh, many of the aspects that I discussed uh, over the last half hour or so. Uh, in 2012, there was a, a special edition by Architecture and Urbanism, which, of course, in the field of architecture, urban design, urban planning is a very important um, publication. Uh, this uh, edition was uh, titled Singapore, Capital City for Vertical Green. So clearly what is stated here is not, not just an architectural agenda or the agenda of some uh, urban design practices, but it is clearly an agenda for uh, the whole of Singapore. So I would say that Singapore has for quite some time now, of course, recognized uh, the importance of uh, these developments. And of course, uh, has uh, since its uh, foundation independence in the 1960s, uh, always been interested in uh, first being uh, a garden city and then later the planning paradigm changed to 
being a city in a garden and what is now discussed on the level of planning and policy making is making uh, Singapore a city in uh, nature. So I think this, uh, this uh, special edition of Architecture and Urbanism highlights that it is indeed a very fertile ground uh, that these experiments that I shared with you fall onto uh, in the context of Singapore. Some very recent developments uh, to, uh, in a way, illustrate where the discourse stands right now and where the practice of architecture and urban design stands right now. This is, again, a, a very recent, quite a massive uh, mixed-use development in uh, the central business district of uh, Singapore. It's uh, Ingenhofen Architects uh, Marina One. And what I would like to highlight here is uh, one, of course, again, the, the inclusion of uh, green space on uh, multiple levels. So we're not on ground level here. We are somewhere on level 10, I believe, in the building. So there's a massive uh, atrium space that is lush and green and is uh, accessible uh, by everyone uh, in the central business district area. But here's really what I'm trying to get at. Again, you see the strategy uh, is to connect to an adjacent uh, urban green space to pull the greenery uh, over here, uh, two levels in the building, uh, provide an atrium space on multiple levels, and then replicate green spaces uh, throughout, uh, throughout the project. So this is not just uh, to, again, to provide a, a nice lush and green environment, which I think already is an important uh, achievement, but there are many, many uh, interesting uh, massing strategies and technological uh, aspects to the inclusion of greenery in this project uh, that uh, also come with uh, the dense and green paradigm in architecture. Another example I want to uh, quickly share with you is uh, a very recent project again by uh, Boha uh, titled um, Kampung Admiralty. Uh, I would argue it is a high density uh, project. Uh, it is uh, catering to the elderly uh, population, which with the demographic change that happens here in Singapore, as well as in many other parts of the world, is, is somehow uh, an important aspect to, to deal with for architects and urban designers. But what this project does is, uh, it layers um, multiple programs, public programs, uh, commercial programs on the, on the ground level with uh, programs that uh, cater to the elderly population, uh, such as uh, uh, doctors, hospitals, uh, all sorts of uh, things that deal with physical therapy uh, that, that would be good uh, for elderly, communal facilities, etc. It combines it with uh, uh, elderly uh, housing in, in these towers uh, on the side. And all of this is topped with uh, a very large uh, green elevated uh, park. So this picture is not, again, not taken from ground level, but from somewhere up. So you see uh, what kind of uh, high quality, uh, high density urban environment is achieved in a, in a project like this. I think it becomes even more obvious when we look at the the building uh, section. So again, this is not just uh, to have uh, nice greenery included on multiple levels, but it serves uh, uh, multiple functions. It filters rainwater, uh, it helps with urban heat island effects, and so on and so on. So it covers many of the aspects I touched on earlier in the presentation. This, uh, another project we have studied over the, the last couple of years is Pungo Waterway Terraces 1 by uh, Group 8 uh, Asia uh, and Aedas uh, architects. And uh, I included uh, this project because it shows very nice the inclusion of, uh, in this case, a sunken green space in uh, one of these uh, courtyards. In fact, uh, this courtyard is called uh, a jungle courtyard. And again, this courtyard connects what you don't see here on the slide on the right to a linear a green and a blue space that connects the building uh, to the larger uh, networks of uh, the city of Singapore. 
Uh, this image uh, shows you, uh, it illustrates in a way the, the tremendous interest that we have uh, received in the work that we have been doing over the last couple of years. Uh, this is our exhibition at the 2018 uh, Venice Biennale. And we are supposed to be included in this year's Biennale as well. But of course, as you know, because of the COVID situation, uh, we don't know if it's gonna happen, when it's gonna happen. It's, gonna, it's uh, currently scheduled to open at the end of August, but uh, I guess we all have to stay tuned if, if it actually happens. So if so, please go there, have a look at, uh, at our exhibition there. Coming back uh, to the more scientific aspects uh, of our research, we have, of course, with the Future Cities Laboratory, used uh, scientific methods to understand better uh, the services that uh, these buildings provide. So we have looked in a lot of detail uh, into the question of biodiversity. So are there biodiversity services these buildings provide? The short answer is yes. The long answer, unfortunately, in the interest of time, I have to refer you uh, to, to our book. So we have looked at uh, plants, we have looked at uh, animals and indeed what we found compared to control cases around the buildings that we studied is that there is a very positive impact that uh, dense and green buildings have on uh, biodiversity. We have looked at uh, aspects of uh, building performance such as surface temperature which of course particularly in the tropics as I mentioned earlier is a very important aspect where it is a lot about the cooling of uh, facades so clearly we, we can uh, show that the use of uh, greenery in dense and green buildings helps with bringing down the cooling load. Uh, and that of course translates to bringing down the energy needs uh, of uh, dense and green buildings. So for this, we have put sensors in buildings and uh, taken uh, thermal images and uh, so on. So we have used uh, multiple methodologies to understand this. We have also looked at the uh, construction and maintenance costs of integrated green spaces in uh, buildings, uh, because we found that very often when we present our research, that is one of the, the first question that uh, comes up is, yeah, it's all nice and beautiful, but isn't it very expensive? So, of course, we cannot talk for the, the whole world, but certainly the cases that we have studied uh, in Singapore, what we found is the increase in construction and maintenance costs when you do a dense and green, a typical dense and green building in, in this climatic uh, context that we're in is about three to 5%. But uh, what is interesting is uh, that we also found that the return on investment is quite substantial. So I give you just one example, which is uh, uh, a hotel here, uh, the Park Royale on Pickering by uh, Voha Architects, which is a dense and green building, uh, which is a four-star hotel, but it charges uh, five-star hotel uh, prices. And interestingly, dense and green buildings have a positive uh, impact uh, economically, not only on uh, their, their own space, but also on the urban space around them. So a project like um, OASIA Hotel downtown also leads to an increase in, uh, in rents of buildings that have now the, the very nice view of, of this building right in front of them. Uh, we have studied in quite some depth also the economic benefits of vegetation on and around residential developments. So are, willing, are people willing, residents willing to pay more to live in a dense and green building? And again, the short answer is yes. And uh, we have looked at this in the context of Singapore. We have looked at this in multiple locations uh, uh, on, the, on the island. And uh, I think we found some very, very interesting uh, results, which again, unfortunately, in the interest of time, I have to refer you to uh, to our uh, publications. Uh, before I conclude, um, I give you uh, one example here of a typical case study in the, the book uh, that served also as the basis for our current exhibition at the National Design Center. 
So we have studied a project like OAsia Hotel downtown in terms of uh, its uh, green contribution to the larger urban uh, context that it sits in. We have uh, then looked at uh, the architectural strategies and mapped all this in a series of isometric uh, drawings that are exploded that you see here on the right. Uh, we have looked again at aspects of uh, biodiversity in terms of plants, in terms of plants as well as uh, animals. We have studied in great detail uh, surface temperature, so the energetic performance of buildings like this and the positive impact that greenery can have on the building, uh, in this case, behind the screen. And uh, we have looked at uh, the space use, the social component. So how do people actually use these spaces? What do they like about them? Do they use spaces that are green more than spaces that are not green in, uh, in uh, quite some detail? And we have provided uh, these so-called social heat maps. And you see an example uh, to the right where we uh, tracked over the course of days and weeks and months, uh, the use of uh, green spaces, common and public green spaces in such buildings. So I will conclude with uh, this image, which uh, is one of my favorite uh, uh, photographs uh, of uh, Kampung Admiralty, uh, because it talks about, uh, in my opinion, a beautiful integration of uh, of livable space, green space, high density uh, architecture in a, in a quite dense uh, part uh, of Singapore. And I want to conclude with uh, this short statement here uh, to also provide a segue to the panel discussion that uh, will follow. Uh, density, as many of the dense and green projects we have studied uh, demonstrate, can be designed and designed well. It can be the ultimate test of intelligent design and at its best make our cities more beautiful, more livable, more sustainable, and more resilient. And with this, I will conclude and uh, stop sharing my screen. So back to Geraldine Prince. Thank you, Prof Professor Thomas Schroepfer, for bringing us around the world to view exemplary green architecture that not only inspires, but also stretches our imagination. So right now, before we proceed to the next section, which is um, the panel discussion, we have launched a poll um, to get a sense of um, what you people in the audience are experiencing. So the question is, what is the furthest you would walk to a green feature or a park? Um, two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 or more than 15 minutes. Please take some time to fill up this um, survey, this short survey. So here we've got, most people would walk 10 minutes or even up to 15 minutes to reach to, a near, to reach a nearest park or a green feature. I think that's, that's great. We shall begin the panel discussion, firstly, by introducing our panelists. So earlier on, we had already introduced a few people. Mr. Mark Wee, Executive Director of Design Singapore Council. We have Professor Stephen Kent, Program Director of Future Cities Laboratory at the Singapore ETH Centre. Professor Thomas Schroepfer, Professor and Founding Associate Head of Pillar, for architecture and Sustainable Design at SUTD. And now, also joining them in this panel, we have Professor Roland Bofenay. He is Associate Professor in the Engineering and Product Development Pillar in SUTD. Professor Bofenay is also the Director of SUTD Applied Complexity Group that conducts interdisciplinary research at the interface of complexity science, artificial intelligence, and engineering design. He is also the co-principal investigator of the city's urban science and design for density research project at SUTD. He is finally also a research associate with the Department of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. Up next, we have Ms. Srivalita Gopalakrishnan. She is landscape architect and first vice president of the Council of the Singapore Institute of Landscape Architects, or SILA. Sri has over 15 years of professional experience and a diverse portfolio of projects across Singapore, Malaysia, China, Hong Kong, and India. She worked with Kiara Design in Singapore for over 11 years on projects ranging from residential, commercial, hospitality, institutional, recreational, to master planning, with many of her projects winning accolades. Last but not least, we have Professor Sasha Menz. He's Professor for Architecture and Building Process at ETH Zurich 
and co-investigator of the dense and green building typology research project at the Future Cities Laboratory, as Thomas has mentioned earlier. He also served as Dean of the Department of Architecture, founded and led the Institute of Technology in, Ar in Architecture at ETH Zurich, and he founded SAM Architects and Part Partners in 1997, where he has been actively engaged in architectural competitions throughout the world. His publications include Public Space Evolution in High Density Living in Singapore and three books on the building process. So here we have six panelists for this evening. So in this panel, we will discuss impact of density in cities and the impact on city dwellers. What is the value of green buildings in high density cities? Can density be designed to make cities more livable, sustainable and resilient? And at a time of pandemic, how can we reduce the vulnerability of a dense city? So perhaps we'll start off um, the panel discussion with Mark. So Mark, in your opinion, first of all, why do we need to discuss about density? Why is this an important topic? I mean, I think obviously density is, uh, is important for a variety of reasons. I mean, we've learned that density actually has been very real and has even sort of deadly effects. I mean, the most obvious example being the rapid spread of the virus recently in sort of more highly urbanized sort of cities that we've seen. Uh, so obviously Singapore being a city, New York, um, I mean, you, you see that definitely. Um, we also learned that by, but alongside that, um, the idea of sort of density being able to just be intensify some of these things. We've also learned that by 2025, I think more than 600 cities actually will have a population of over a million people. So really this whole discussion of actually how to live well in such environments actually therefore really come at a very timely moment. And um, all the more with the current situation. So what I hope to actually to discuss with uh, my fellow pa panelists tonight and our audience as well is how can we actually collectively reimagine our future cities as spaces that actually can allow, can allow residents to be safe, healthy, and thriving at the same time. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next, we move on to Professor Sasha Menz. So Sasha, in the Dense and Green Building Typology Research Project, you looked at the different benefits of green building typologies in high-density cities, including environmental, social, economic, and aesthetics. Do some of these needs sometimes compete, and how should planners and designers deal with these competing needs? Thank you, uh, Geraldine, and welcome to everybody from Switzerland. Still cold here, as you can see, I'm wearing a jacket and you're all sitting in the tropics. And uh, of course, dense and green is also a big question in, in Europe and uh, of course also in Switzerland. Our cities are not as dense, maybe Paris or London, but other cities not yet. But returning to your, returning to your question, yes. Uh, on one hand, the uh, interdisciplinary approach respects the different stakeholders involved. This is what we do. We work interdisciplinary. Thomas has depicted it brilliantly before in his, in his speech. And you, you can see that it's, it's not an architect alone. It's a, it's a diversity of people, scientists, engineers, designers involved and all around questioning economic topics. At the end, the economics in our world are basic are the major topics, but still it's not the only one. All the social questions which came up also by Thomas, how people use these spaces, how they like them, how they even appropriate these spaces if they don't have maybe a clear function. It's all questions which stand for my opinion at the, at the beginning and on uh, our top. And in this sense, it's an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary research, and it will maybe also change, let's say, also the métier, our, the métier of an architect. So it's not, he's not the only one alone at the table creating, but we have to be used to work together with scientists, with botanists, with, with sociologists, with economic involved people. So it's a, it's a big bunch of people and as an architect, I'm a practicing architect, I'm on my way learning to be engaged in all these questions and having all these people uh, in a team. And we showed it within our Future Cities Lab team, together with, with Thomas and the whole team, that we were 
all interdisciplinary and we had to learn like Stephen said, our different languages. English was our, let's say, common ground, but it's not English alone. There are different English and uh, different languages. So we had really to understand each other, respect each other, and, and these are maybe some new topics to be achieved in the future when you work as an architect, when you work as an urban planner. Thank you, Sasha. So talking about different disciplines, we have a landscape architect here, Sri. So Sri, as a landscape architect, can you share with us what is the value of integrated open spaces? Thank you, Geraldine, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, I do bring uh, one of the dimensions which Sasha mentioned. Um, and I think integrated green open spaces are actually extremely um, critical in uh, when we talk about uh, livability, when we talk about um, uh, sustainability in density and high density environments. Um, so the open spaces, of course, they give you all the uh, values which Thomas has already shared, which is environmental, um, ecological, social, um, the health and um, well-being benefits, um, and of course the um, economic benefits. But I think there are a few more dimensions which it adds. Uh, one is, uh, which I think is very, very significant, is the idea of accessibility and connectivity. I think once you integrate buildings, um, not just at the ground level, but at multiple levels as we are uh, moving uh, vertical, um, it kind of brings those spaces right to your doorsteps. And I think in today's, uh, today's um, living, um, having the access to nature at your doorstep is a luxury. And uh, what we have seen is, um, that is where there is the difference of uh, a high density city becoming livable uh, versus becoming um, you know, a concrete jungle. So um, that's a, a very, very significant value which integrated open spaces add. Um, and of course the aesthetics and the branding and the image uh, of uh, more integrated green spaces is also something which is uh, extremely valuable towards uh, uh, having a city perceived as livable. Yeah. Thank you, Sri. So today we have, in our title, it's dense and green city. So there are two components, the dense part and the green part, right? So um, for Stephen, in your work, you've explored different kinds of settlements and different kinds of densities. Is there such thing as a good density or bad density? Can good density be designed? The simple answer is yes. Um, <laughs> there, there must be a good and there must be a bad density. Otherwise, they wouldn't need designers to manage it. Um, but of course, the really interesting thing and the, is the devil is in the detail. Um, you know, as Mark has already alluded, density is is really significant issue again. Uh, for a long time, everybody basically felt that a, a good city was a dense city. Um, of course, there was always Los Angeles and there was always, you know, sprawl, sprawl conditions. But generally, people thought that high density cities were, were the right way to make cities. And you can think about that from the Singaporean agencies like the URA, the Statutory Planning Authority, uh, the Housing Authority. You could go to the World Bank, the UN, the IPCC even. This is the agency looking at planetary climate change. Still regards the city as a dense city as a good city. Now, of course, that's all um, up for debate again. Um, and I think there's, the data is, is just not available to us. We simply don't know the effects of density and, and the, the pandemic. Um, but it's very useful to rethink about, rethink density again. Um, density is a really beautiful uh, term. Of course, it doesn't mean we're talking obviously inside a disciplinary framework. We're not talking about the density of stone or wood. We're talking about population density. So how populations are gathered together. As Thomas already alluded to, this is not only population of people, there's population of animals perhaps and bugs. And I noticed a couple of people asking about mosquitoes. So there's an ecological density that goes with it. We've got to think a little bit about that. And I think Thomas's uh, book has already sketched that stuff out. So density is very important to understand. We're talking about population density. Um, it's also related to a number of other words. It's related to other words like um, intensity and compactness, tightness, uh, crowdedness. In fact, it's quite different from crowdedness. So the benefits of density lie in intensity density, it can also flip to becoming a very, very dangerous condition. 
um, which is why density is very important in an urban design the sense is very important to distinguish from crowdedness um, so you can have very high quality density which is managed by the reason in the way that the three was talking about how do you access it how do you access the outdoors how do you how do you get public transport how close are jobs um, can you access uh, um, simple things like electricity uh, the Wi-Fi the internet if all of these sort of things are not available then that density very quickly turns into a kind of crowded condition which is a very dangerous and and as we starting to see probably quite a threatening a threatening situation so density is a very tricky term it's right back in the uh, in the in the in the dock of public opinion i think it's a very very important very timely study that we're starting to think about that question as always uh, it's in a city which is one of as we all know is one of the most complex human artifacts ever made it's never one thing it's never just density you can have very high quality density and as we've seen in singapore you get high quality densities and you also get low quality densities as we saw through the the, uh, the the dorms. So at the moment, Singapore is going through a really interesting discussion about how to handle these diverse kinds of density and become again, this really important kind of model for a certain kind of high density and very responsible, uh, responsible urbanism. Thank you, Stephen. So I will summarize that density is a complex issue. So then the next question goes to the complexity scientists, to Roland. So Roland, as a complexity scientist, can you provide some insights on human movement in a dense environment and how human movement may make some places more or less vulnerable? Thank you very much, Geraldine. And indeed, it's a fantastic transition uh, you know, from, from Stephen to, to myself. Uh, because over the last year or so, uh, my research team and I, we have been working on a particular question of uh, human movement in the third dimension. A lot of work has been done on you know, how people move in just you know, two dimensions. but. Uh, third dimension, the vertical dimension, is extremely important. Uh, indeed, uh, density in cities often rhymes with verticality, and very little is known about you know how we move up and down in those vertical cities. So our results uh, showing that some very unique patterns of human vertical movement are taking place. So with uh, Thomas, uh, right now we have uh, we're working on a very exciting project aimed at uh, essentially quantifying the influence of green spaces. Uh, especially when they are vertically distributed in buildings uh, and how they affect human movement. So this uh, clearly will ease the congestion that you have on the ground floor um, and also on the ground as well, and also providing a positive human building interaction. Now, of course, with uh, COVID-19, uh, density goes against the new rules of social distancing. So uh, there comes the question of how do we deal with uh, high density places and obviously uh, density has a very clear definition from the scientific perspective, but density varies widely in the city. And one, you know, we, you know, we might think that uh, there are only places with high density that would be vulnerable to disease transmission, like the, the central business district. But it turns out that the reality is actually more complex than that. Um, what really matters uh, are actually the patterns of human co-presence when we get into contact whether at work or it could be in public spaces, including public transports. And, and Stephen mentioned uh, what happens in the dorms and foreign workers. And these are essentially, uh, this is a separate population. So they have a lot of cases, uh, but it's confined to their dorms uh, because they actually do not interact much with the rest of the population in Singapore. Uh, but what will happen if you have a breach between those dorms and the community? So the, the, really the patterns of human co-presence are truly essential. Now, how can we make uh, some of these places less vulnerable? That's a, that's a tricky question. Um, uh, if you use large-scale network-based models of human co-presence, for instance, uh, along with uh, big data that can help us chart how people within a particular location connect and interact. Uh, the idea of doing you know, population contact tracing is I think almost impossible in practice to do. Uh, but if you have these kind of, of simple models of co-presence, you know, coupled with uh, specific epidemiological models, then you have the potential to identify uh, what we can call super spreader locations, places uh, where there is a high risk of transmission. And this will also help the governments in terms of having targeted measures. Right now, what we have around the world, or at least in Singapore, is a blanket ban, you know, lockdowns for everyone 
but obviously not all places are created equal and not all places deserve to be under lockdown. So uh, those models could actually help in two ways. Uh, first, to avoid you know, what some people call the virus fatigue, uh, to, which is going to wear out communities and cause people to lower the guard against the disease, but also I help the government optimize in terms of deploying resources to the places that really need to be, um, uh, that are considered vulnerable and dangerous. Thank you, Roland. This pretty much goes up to Thomas. In summary of two questions by Raji Iyer as well as Max Kohler. Um, the question goes, does the maintenance of green buildings use much resources and generate more waste? Would technology such as AI-driven te AI -driven systems mitigate this? It's actually a great question uh, for the research that we do. And it's, it's particularly, if I can you know, uh, bring the question to Shri, because she's the landscape architect uh, on, the, on the team. She has also worked with us on the, particularly those questions, uh, construction and maintenance costs uh, that are affiliated with uh, dense and green building typologies. So Shri, if you don't mind, would you like to say something about this? Sure, the first, the first question. I think the second one we can we can take both. Yeah. Huh? The perception that maintenance of all these uh, dense and green buildings is very expensive. Um, it can be dealt with at the very initial stages of design. Um, if they were very expensive, you won't see so many of them being built. You know. Um, so what we saw was that the projects which um, addressed the concerns of long-term maintenance access. Uh, safety requirements, if all these have been addressed upfront in the design uh, using very simple um, inclusions like, you know, having um, access to the planting areas and making sure that you don't uh, expect them to hang from gondolas to maintain them. Uh, the general cost for maintenance has been uh, quite reasonable because uh, eventually the costs go high when you need um, high skilled workers to maintain. So if the maintenance regimen is similar to what you would do on the ground, the costs are not very high. So I think at the end of the day, it also depends on how you detail and how you design these uh, multi-level uh, green systems. Yeah. Yeah. So I've, I can I can take the second part of the the question, which was on the use of technology, right, and uh, AI. Uh, we found in our research that uh, often, and architects have experimented with all sorts of ways for irrigation, for example, in, in the dense and green buildings that we studied over the years. And what we found is that it's often the, the very simple details that do not require a lot of mechanical, you know, um, maintenance or any kind of technological uh, component that work the best. Uh, so if you, if you take, for example, um, OASIA Hotel downtown that we looked at a couple of times uh, today, uh, the detail is really very simple. You have um, a screen that is uh, filled with uh, creepers that grow through the screen and along the screen. And there is on every level or every other level, there's a planter box and anyone can go there and just water the plants, right? So it's that simple. Uh, Complicated technological systems, they, they tend to fail. Uh, that has to do with simply the scale of buildings and the fact that they're exposed to the elements. Uh, I wouldn't exclude the possibility that there are very, very smart systems that can help us. I mean, particularly in the realm of AI that we're only starting to explore what the possibilities are. But uh, experience with these buildings over the last couple of years has actually shown that the simpler the detail the better it seems to work. Would you agree, Sri? Yeah, I have to agree on that, that it's, it's actually about the detail. If we can um, put a little bit more time and effort in detailing these, um, in the long run, they are not as expensive or as difficult. Yeah, I'd just like to add that very important is the balance between the inputs and the outputs. What I want to say is that you get benefits with the greenery. So you do, a, a, let's say, a primary investment, but let's say on the, on the energetic performance of a building, if you keep it <clears throat> um, technically 
on a, on a very basic, as Thomas said, on a basic level, you can get a lot of energetic positive performance. This is just what I want to say. So you do, you, you give a, a monetary input at the beginning, but you get uh, a payback at the end. And this is always, you have to balance this when you, when you start your planning and keep the details as easy as possible, like Thomas said. So it's basically some kind of a cost-benefit analysis right from the beginning. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, for the next question is to do with food. So this question by Jaden Ong. The question goes, addressing food security is one of the key national agendas at the moment. Can we integrate community-scale food production seamlessly into green building design? I'm going to give this a step. I'll probably need a little bit of help from the rest, on, especially on the technical parts. But... Uh, um, I think definitely regards to sort of uh, increasing um, more domestic production of food in vertical cities, in dense cities, uh, will be needed for any city. And uh, of, of course, in particular, cities like Singapore, where we depend a lot on sort of uh, uh, diverse uh, channels for food supply. Um, I think that's something Singapore has um, um, planned. I think there's a, uh, the goal is about to hit 30%. Uh, domestic production in the next couple of years, but also I can't help but see that home, that ambition being able to co-mingle with this easily in a dense green city, right? Because uh, if you are, have the ability to plan for vertical environments integrating greenery, I think hence there might be a uh, ability, a natural ability to be able to then think about how can that greenery potentially be used for food. Um, so I think that's uh, going to be a very natural reality for all of us. I feel that those things have become more common, especially in situation increasingly. And I'm in, eventually it will become just part and parcel of how you live, right? Just being able to step out of your high rise to a green patch and as well as to farm some, some food. Thank you, Mark. Um, I know that Stephen is very passionate about growing your own food as well. Stephen, do you have something to say about this? Yeah, thanks for uh, spotting my itchy finger there. I was <laughs> 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 I'm like really, uh, I love growing vegetables, um, but that's not, what, not, the, not the point. I would just want to add to what Mark was saying. I think this is an immensely interesting area. Um, Singapore is really working hard on this and it has this very memorable policy goal of 30% of domestic food production by 2030. So 30 by 30, keep that in mind. Most people say it's incredibly difficult and very challenging to do that. Um, and well, But what I find very interesting about it is it, it's clearly what you can grow outside your window or even on more complex, uh, you know, exoskeleton type structures you can kind of imagine coming out of the work that Thomas and Sasha have already sketched. You can already see emerging models, especially in some of the more speculative things that Woha was doing in the studio. Um, it's clear that this is not going to deliver you the efficiencies of industrialized food production. So you're still going to have to be importing, um, you know, from the giant rice farms all around Asia, the wheat from the US or Australia and so on. You simply can't compete uh, at a local kind of fragmented sort of uh, cottage industry level. But at the higher end of the market, the boutique end, the very high value crops, um, particularly if you have a very, very short um, you know, a farm to farm to table uh, sensitivity. Once logistics comes into it, you can get m incredibly high value, and I think economically very very relevant models for um, for producing food much closer to the city itself. And w again, one of the things that's that's emerged in the in the current pandemic um, is precisely the the length of the supply chains to cities all around the world, but especially Singapore where the city boundary is also a national boundary. So there's a huge amount of work being going on with the Singapore Food um, Agency modeling these kinds of supply chains. And I would just underline, despite all of this, Singapore still ranks number one in the world for food security, quite amazing. Um, yeah. it's, being, it's being eroded rapidly by the COVID situation. So it's dropping down very quickly, but nonetheless, it's still number one in the world. So it's quite an amazing um, situation. And I think this direction is very, very, very exciting. Thanks for asking me to tune in on that topic. <laughs> You're welcome. 
Geraldine, can yes. I say something to this? Yes. Uh, I think yeah. when, when Singapore is referring to 30 by 30, of course you cannot achieve this with the kind of community uh, urban farming that we saw in the case of Food Tech Quad Hospital, right? I mean, that just adds to food coming from, from somewhere else. But uh, I think a goal like this can only be achieved through very interesting use of, of technology, right? Often these farms mm -hmm. are entirely inside of buildings. Uh, they're artificially led. So that is actually an area where a lot of technology advancements uh, take place. So mm -hmm. there are all sorts of interesting things that are explored right now. And uh, it, is, it is quite different from you know, the greenery that we have referred to in, uh, in the presentation, even though there is, as I said, and we see this with uh, student projects in the university, when uh, students get to, own, uh, to choose their own topic for, let's say, a thesis project, there's a tremendous interest in the younger generation in exploring, uh, you know, food production, uh, urban farming as a topic in architecture and landscape architecture. Thank you very much, Thomas. The next question, I believe, goes out to Roland. Um, this is about movement of people. So what else should we consider when designing cities for walkability? In terms of land use, how should city planners, in order to make a city more livable, be able to encourage better interface between different projects, not only horizontally, but also vertically? Uh, a great, great question. So I, I, um, I'm afraid all of us are going to sound like we're promoting Singapore and, and doing publicity for what the, the government is doing, but it's true that there are many uh, this is already something going on in Singapore, trying to improve uh, walkability uh, and uh, the distribution of, of parks and uh, uh, how you move, as I, as I said, how we move in, in three dimensions. Mm -hmm. let, let me just touch on this particular question because I think, you know, uh, Singapore is doing something different and it's easy to understand. So if, if you go to another big Asian city, let's say you go to Shenzhen or uh, some other place uh, in Hong Kong, for instance, typically, uh, moving up and down means that you are taking an elevator right between the top of a skyscraper to the, the ground floor and uh, simple as that. So your vertical movement is limited and often just based on an elevator ride. But in Singapore, you have a different use of the vertical dimension. Uh, Thomas shown the, um, the uh, Kampong and Mirati building where you can gradually go from one floor to another by, you know, uh, being outdoor. Uh, walking outdoor. So that reduces the use of air conditioning, for instance, at the same time you are enjoying greenery. So this is this is something that we could promote uh, on a larger scale uh, at the city level, where different buildings like that would be integrated. Um, there are some, some examples uh, in place in Singapore where you have MRT stations connected to shopping centers that are connected to hospitals, for instance, I think about Jurong East, uh, and where the government is trying to also uh, have, you know, um, the pedestrians have access without the cars being around and all the traffic being uh, being separated, the, the car traffic being separated. So your experience would be better because uh, you enjoy walking more if you are not, you know, surrounded by cars, if you don't have the exhaust from the cars. Uh, on the top of that, it improves the connectivity between buildings. So there is indeed a lot of work that can be done. Uh, but this has to be done, as I said, not just at the building level, it has to be integrated at the district level um, uh, across um, uh, different plots. And this is where, you know, uh, um, uh, the government, governments have to be involved because only they can essentially help uh, facilitate that take place between different, different plots when they do uh, a new district development, for instance. So there is a real uh, possibility to bring down the, the density by having people working at different levels. Accessibility is the big, big trigger. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we can engage planners, if you can engage also the authorities and even, even the, the, the investors in this sense, then we need really to talk about accessibility of a building because usually buildings are privatized and it's a, is it a common space, the green space, is it, a, is it a public space, which makes it a lot more difficult. And I think here's a kind of a trigger. Here we have to, to debate it and we have to be open-minded because here new models come up of accessibilities of buildings in the, in the future. If, 
in Singapore, you have a lot of very good examples about, about this, uh, let's say, open space and open accessible buildings, but not all of them, not all of them are. And this, I think, is, is a challenge, is a challenge for the future. We have to think about that. Thank you, Sasha. Okay, I think we have a final question. How do we design for safety? I think especially in the time of pandemic, which we're all experiencing now, our lives have changed drastically in the past few months. How can we design for safety and for resilience? Yeah, just to um, riff a little bit on the last uh, thread, um, I think safety ends, ends up in a slightly narrow area, you know, of health and safety. But I think resilience is a very interesting uh, topic. And I was just thinking a little bit about what Roland was saying. Um, you know, we end up, we do end up reflect, reflecting a lot in these kinds of environments about the, the amazing things that have been done in Singapore. But when you come to nature, it, it is quite interesting to see where the limits are because Singapore as a city state um, increasingly has to start to think in a way about ASEAN as a larger ecosystem. So I think many, I was reading some of the, the, the threads in, in, in the book. So if you look at bird migration species, for example, they're not living within the bounds of the nation state of Singapore. Of course, these are, these are long distance travelers sometimes. Um, so in a way, Singapore uh, is starting then in that respect, thinking about this broader question of nature and, and resilience, is starting to become a part considering itself much more within a kind of regional ecology. Um, and I think that's typical for an outlook of a nation state that has a lot of uh, land, um, like the, the United States or Europe, for example, or Australia. But Singapore has to think itself much more as a kind of... Um, as a kind of archipelago in this larger kind of framework of nature. And I think that's also starting to emerge um, in the way Singapore is, is often taking a very uh, progressive role in ASEAN. So transnational associations. And of course, this has, a, this has an ecological dimension. Uh, for those of you who, who live in Singapore, we know that we suffer this very complicated you know, process of the haze, which is a trans-border ecological disaster. And I think if you scale it up to kind of the level of COVID, uh, we have to be thinking across trans-border logics. And I think they're paying attention to nature um, slightly beyond the scale of the building and, and the urban plot starts to become very interesting. And I think very important to the bigger question of, relevant, uh, of, of resilience. Thank you. Um, I noticed that Sri has a response as well. And on top of what you're going to respond, I'm going to piggyback one last question, which I think is probably meant for you. Um, how do you think other parts of the world can follow Singapore's examples? Do you believe that legislations should change and consider integration of green space in new buildings? First is the first response in terms of the safety. Um, it's quite an interesting um, component, like you know how you view safety kind of changes depending on what becomes a factor to be safe from, right? Um, I know when we were designing these buildings for a long time, the safety was more about how to make sure that people are safe when they maintain these buildings or how do you make sure that construction time, the safety is man managed. And now the safety aspect has moved to health, hygiene, interaction, um, you know, even um, co-location, whether it's safe. So um, I think for us, it needs to be more adaptable, be able to change, be able to respond. I think that is where, uh, the safety aspect comes in for Singapore because it's not as straightforward as a blanket uh, way of dealing with safety. Um, and in terms of Singapore example of uh, green, yes, of course, there needs to be legislation changes. And the reason why we see these kind of um, dense and green integrated buildings in Singapore, I have to say, uh, was triggered by the change in policies like lush, like uh, sky rise greenery, like um, you know, the green mark, the leaf area index, the need for um, green plot ratios. So there needs to be a change in legislation and policies to make sure that um, it kind of, uh, in a way, forces people to think about new way of designing these buildings and integrating green space. Um, and over the span of time, when people start looking at um, the value it adds, I think it becomes a, a practice. You don't need legislation after that. You would do it because it gives you the benefits. 
Um, so yes, if you have to change, I think the first step is to make sure that there is a policy change, there is a legislation change to how you design buildings in the first place. Thank you. I think um, with that, we will wrap up the Q&A and I would like to invite each panelist to um, give a closing statement, a uh, one-liner about what's the key takeaway from the discussion and the presentations uh, this evening. So maybe um, can I start with Thomas? Okay, thank you, Geraldine. Uh, in my case, it's not a one-liner, it's a multi-multi-liner. Uh, I think developing compact cities with extensive greenery and highly livable environments is really a very important strategy in addressing rapid urbanization. I think innovative, dense and green design, uh, in my opinion, can contribute significantly to the creation of attractive and ecologically balanced urban environments by offering a wide range of urban, architectural, environmental, social and economic benefits. And I think the benefits also include uh, a higher level of resilience in a situation like the one we're in right now. Uh, it might not help directly with the virus when you're infected, but certainly to survive the situation, you know, not to uh, die from cabin fever, it is really important to be in an environment that is uh, dense as Singapore, but at the same time allows us to go out and reach a green space uh, very, very quickly. I think that makes a huge uh, difference in terms of resilience of uh, the city. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, may I next invite Mark to give a closing statement? Since Thomas did it, I'll give a few lines <laughs> and not just one line. Um, I think one thing is people actually still, I, I, what I've taken away from this whole thing is people will still want to interact and enjoy the city, but they also now want to feel safe. So the challenge actually now is actually how do you create those same dynamic design experiences while also upholding all these new guidelines that we'll see formed in the, year, in the months to come or in the years to come. But generally, people may not visit spaces if this experience promises to be stressful. But I also believe that as more people still want to move to cities for opportunities, then people will also work more from home. And hence, like now, after sitting at your desk, for the entire day looking at your screen on your breaks so or at the end of the day we actually need green spaces to easily get to quickly beyond the planned trip to the nature reserve the 10 to 15 minute walk in and out of the city so i believe that there'll be a need actually in my view there's a need for a wider range of nature spaces made accessible to people in terms of size perhaps character and of course programming and these could be places for one two five ten or 100 people to escape to, to enjoy the outdoors, because more people will want to go to the outdoors now, uh, to be enjoyed quickly or longer, but most importantly, this new thing about safely. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Um, I think we should then move on to the landscape architect. Sri, what's your response? I have to agree to the points which Thomas and Mark have already said, but for me, the, the key aspect is that the value of having uh, green open spaces, a close proximity where you can just step down and be able to reach um, is something um, which has been more pronounced in the current situation than before. Um, and we tend to start valuing every bit of green space which we have around us. Um, so while we um, are addressing all these challenges of the pandemic, I also see on a positive note that there are quite interesting uh, positives to take from. Uh, like there is community resilience, which we have seen. We have seen spatial adaptability. We've seen improved environmental quality. We've seen vibrant biodiversity. Um, there is an increased awareness of health and hygiene. And also there is a fostering of a sustainable lifestyle. You know? So um, all these are forced temporary transformations, but it might just encourage equitable and sustainable urban future, actually. Um, and in a way, accelerate the global response to larger issues of uh, climate change and global warming. Thank you, Sri. Um, zooming out, as you mentioned, global issues. Um, perhaps we can have Roland give the next statement. Thank you. All right. So uh, I'll be very short. Just two words. Uh, interdisciplinary design. Okay, uh, let me elaborate a bit. But I think <laughs> this, the solution to all these problems is to bring you know, architects, 
designers, scientists, complexity scientists, you know, uh, uh, ecological scientists, you bring them together, right, to, to design a better city. Uh, you, you read in a newspaper now that, you know, because of COVID, right, people are essentially fleeing cities and considering their new life in, in going out of city. I, I just don't believe in that. I, I don't buy it. I think, you know, for sure, you know, some cities are poorly designed and they don't have a high quality of living. But uh, a well-designed city is with, you know, greenery where you can meet your friends and uh, it's a fantastic city. So, but that, that requires uh, good design. Uh, interdisciplinary design. So I'll close with this. Thank you very much. And I think the next natural person to respond to interdisciplinary design would be Stephen. Yes. Um, well, it's it's been a super interesting um, evening. You can see dusk going down outside my window. Um, for me, the the really exciting aspects are, in a way, this kind of format. This is a kind of meeting that we could not possibly have had if we'd all flown, taken flights. Although. We'd love to host you all in Singapore and we could have shown you a really great time. There's fantastic food, fantastic public spaces. But in a way, we all know carbon footprint, all kinds of other financial issues simply don't make that possible. So I think there's a kind of emerging kind of cyber density, which becomes super interesting. And we all have had those headaches, right, where you get this very, very sort of intense Zoom experience. I think it's the beginning of another kind of urban experience. It doesn't deny the other one, but the two are kind of inter, interlinked. And the fact that we can talk to people, you know, like Sasha in Switzerland and here and everybody else online, I think is starting to point the way to another kind of density. And I think Mark alluded to it as well. That density has to be embedded in the physical density of the house. And if you don't happen to have a very nice house, uh, if it's just one room and you happen to have young children there and you happen to be the woman uh, who typically looks after the household, then this is a very, very stressful environment. So the cyber physical future world is not so is not so so much fun. So I think we have to think about the domestic very, very ordinary density, plus the new possibilities of this kind of density. Um, I'm an architect, so I'm always a little bit upbeat about this. So um, I'm looking forward to the next discussion. Thanks again. Thank you, Stephen, for your upbeat <laughs> final closing statement. And Sasha, your closing statement, please. Yes, thank you to all of you with your final statements, which I absolutely, absolutely agree. And I wanted to point more on, on, Roland's, on Roland's final statements. And uh, of course you did it and I don't have to repeat it. And I'm happy, Roland, that we will be working together in the future. But what I want to say is that since 1950 and nowadays in the last 70 years in Europe, especially in Switzerland, <clears throat> housing space, private space, has increased in about 30%. So houses get bigger. And in the last 10 years, I experienced that housing space decreases because of price, the price of the, of the land. And I think we're going to do a big mistake making our houses smaller. I think exactly now we experience what it is, Stephen in his house, is a happy man. Me in my apartment, which has different spaces to, to go to, is, is fantastic. So the question of the experiences and expand, to expand green space into the vertical, in, especially in Asia, in Europe, a little bit less. But this is a, is a, is a dramatic important, is a dramatic important question. And uh, we have really to rethink our real estate ideas, I'm talking to the developers and I'm talking also to the people in, in governments releasing the rules how we have to build in the future. So this, this, for my opinion, will be one of the real big challenges. And the other one is if we introduce the greenery into our houses, into the vertical, we have even to rethink our relation to nature. It's a different nature we have as it is outside of our buildings. Goodbye from Switzerland. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank Sasha. you for having me in this discussion. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much to all the panelists. Um, the truth is today's topics have been extremely diverse and we still have many questions that we cannot answer in this two hour webinar. 
So firstly, we would like to apologize. We are deeply sorry that there are still open questions. But what we are extremely happy about is that this session has provoked questions to question the status quo and to challenge your imagination. So we would like to thank all of you for joining us this evening or this morning, wherever you are from, and hope that you have gained some interesting insights. Almost finally, as much as we cannot see every one of you in this virtual environment, the sharing, the lively discussion and the energy is real. So thank you very much for sharing this evening or your morning with us. Um, I would like to thank especially our superheroes behind the scene. So if everything has been running pretty smoothly, they are because it's just because there are superheroes behind doing all this work, um, working tirelessly to make this event happen. So special thanks goes out to Daniel Wong from SUTD and Janine Liu from Design Singapore Council and also to the rest of the Design Singapore team. A very, very big thank you to you. With this, um, I've said all my thanks. I wish you a very, very pleasant evening ahead. Keep well, good night, and hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.